if you create a business where you really say to people, look, here's the mission, here's the context, do your best and use your best judgment and be decent. And, you know, you don't need that many rules. We were intent on creating a business which, you know, had a social mission, attracted people who wanted to fulfill that mission and used their common sense and were decent and behaved well. How do some of the world's sharpest minds start their day? By putting their brain first. And it's not just our secret leaders who kick off every day with heights. From Stephen Fry to best-selling author and fellow podcaster Dr. Wrong and Chatterjee, who give us rave reviews. So if you care about your brain's health and cognitive potential, think heights. Listeners can get 25% off their first month with the code LEADERSHEIGHTS at www.yourheights.com. From a business desk at the Birmingham Post, to the Congo, to the world's fastest growing tech for good platform. Belgian born Anne Marie Huby is one of the UK's most innovative entrepreneurs, bringing the first online fundraising platform to these shores in 2000. This was after a career in radio journalism in Belgium and two years freelance journalism in the UK. She then went to set up the UK arm of Doctors Without Borders, also known as Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF, for 10 years. In 1994, Anne-Marie was in Congo, formerly Zaire with MSF, not long after the genocide which saw Rwandan soldiers and Hutu gangs claim the lives of more than half a million Tutsis and moderate Hutus. MSF received a Nobel Peace Prize just one year before Amory transformed the humanitarian landscape by launching Just Giving with co-founder Zareen Karras, bringing social purpose and technology together. In many ways, it gave rise to a new breed of philanthropy. Launching at the tail end of the dot-com boom and almost running out of money right before it was too late, the company became profitable in just five years. Defying the odds, Just Giving has helped raise over £4 billion to date growing online giving by over 25% each year and helping 28 million people in 164 countries raise more money than they ever thought possible. And now we get to chat to the inspirational entrepreneur herself. So Anne-Marie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Okay, where's your accent from? All over, obviously, but... All over, yeah. Okay, well, let's let's get to that then. So the quick fire first, university, academia or university of life? Uh, In my case, uh, university of life. Oh, really? Well, I, I went to a really crappy college. Okay. So, yeah. You seem quite academic already. We've only spent a few minutes together. Yeah, okay, fair. you'll see. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, UK or Belgium? Now very much UK. Okay, but also because you're assuming we might have more British listeners than Belgian listeners. Smart, hedging her bets. Uh, well, working from home or office-based? If I'm to do any work, it's, it's the office. Okay. Early bird or night owl? Night owl. For profit or not for profit? For profit, for good, preferably. Okay. You're trapped on a desert island. You can bring three things. Your family's there. Gosh, I really thought about this one. I'm very practical. So I thought tent. A lot of people say tent. Yeah, tent. Absolutely. Tent, good set of knives and a, can I do a set of pots to cook with? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Those are my three items. Okay. It's very practical. Absolutely. The circle or iRobot? The circle. I thought it was spot on. Okay. It's not a completely random question, obviously. Life as an entrepreneur, married or single? I've tried both. It works in both cases. Very good answer. It's hedging her bets again. Sun or snow? That's a really hard one. On If pressed, the sun. Okay. Well, you are pressed, so because it's an either or. So sun it is. Introvert or extrovert or bit of both? Introvert. Okay. Most inspirational person in the world to you? Impossible. Too many to quote. But we'll, I'm sure it will we'll come to light. Okay. Yeah. Entrepreneur, techie, wife or mother? Do you ask that question of boys too? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. In that case, um, I think well, probably boys, mum men first. tend to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mum first in the final analysis. Okay. Techie, I, no. I feel, a bit of, I feel a bit of a fraud. Okay. An entrepreneur... Well, I'll tell you more about that. Okay. The men are always in in fear, so they always just go, husband, and then they just move on to the next question. (laughs) Um, Quick fire rounds or real meaningful conversations? Real meaningful conversations. Thank God for that. Right. So from Brussels to London, an education in journalism, then an eventual career in charity. So your journey seems organic, but 
it's probably not so organic, right? So can you tell us a little bit about the start of your journey? Well, I sort sort of wish I could tell you I had a plan. And when I look back, I'm amazed at just how completely accidental it broadly was. I chose journalism almost by default. I grew up in a family that was very while well, leaning to the left, particularly my, my father, who was a real socialist. And so the, the sort of career options certainly didn't include business. I mean, it was almost like a dirty word or certainly not imaginable. My brother ended up being um, a social worker and now he's a sort of international aid type of person. And I thought, as I like to read and write pretty much, I thought, well, you know, how could I choose something that involves that that would improve? press my dad. I mean, consciously or not. And I ended up in journalism college, which was more vocational than academia, which is why I I sort of cheated on the university of life or or real academia. It wasn't very academic, but I learned a lot. And and I thought I was cut out to be a journalist, but I I realized in the couple of years or, you know, that followed that it wasn't really for me. And then I kind of by accident applied for a job at MSF and that completely opened my eyes to the other stuff I could do. So how does one accidentally apply for a job at Medicine Sans Frontier? The whole idea of doing something with a social purpose is something that really is meaningful to me, there's no question. But this particular job, which turned out to be my my real big break in life, uh, which was to sort of be the, the, the sort of head of media, as it was then called at MSF internationally, I became the number two uh, em- employee at the, the kind of newly formed international secretariat for the organization. I, I was so naive, I thought it was a great break, but it was also a poison chalice. I mean, at the time, the organization was in great chaos. I didn't really realise that. And I was given this extraordinary responsibility. But it was also a super exciting time. So it wasn't just about raising the profile of the organisation. It was all about, uh, they had a big 10-year ambition to turn what was an organisation that was partly funded by governments to become you know, within 10 years, completely free of governmental interference. So we needed to sort of think of ways of making MSF much more global, create new new branches, if you like, in, in, in new countries, including the UK, and, and to sort of recruit the talent and raise tons of money to change that balance of funding. And, you know, sometimes it takes the foolish to accept a mandate like that. And I learned tons and realized that I loved not just the content, but organizing and making stuff happen. And that's how I cut my teeth on on business, if you like. And how many people were with you? Where were you based? You know, was it completely based abroad, like all over in different places like Congo, etc.? So was there I, an office? I was based in a tiny office in Brussels. And then we opened branches in West Africa, in East Africa to start with, and then in other uh, countries which were more like fun countries like the US, uh, Scandinavia, Germany, the UK. And my job was to sort of help write the playbook as to how that organization would become known in those countries, make an impact, recruit talent, essentially put a national face on the organization and create the sort of uh, the business plan, if you like, to make sure that not only are people volunteering and becoming part of the movement, but recruit a network of supporters in each country. And it was fun because when, when we addressed the UK, nobody could even pronounce the name. So you met Zareen Karas whilst you were working there. Now, she came to you with a fledgling idea for Just Giving. But before we get on to that, you know, how did you meet? Did you meet on the front line? Did you meet in an office? You know, what is the kind of story of how you two yeah. became friends? Well, we owe our, our sort of professional relationship and, and our friendship really to one guy called Stephen Lloyd. I mean, in, in the sort of social enterprise slash charity world, he was a real god, really. He was an extraordinary guy, a lawyer who who, who helped a lot of organ- non-profit organisations and socially minded businesses grow. He was amazing. And he got to know Zareen first and she had this fledgling idea of, you know, how could we create a platform that would level the playing field and enable a lot of NP- uh, NGOs to thrive and raise more money. And she wanted to find a, a partner and build a team to sort of uh, execute that. And he said, tell you what, I know this woman, I think you'll you'll like each other. And it was incredibly insightful because she told me afterwards that the first time we met, I've, I've actually forgotten, I'm ashamed to say, that first meeting. But when we met... I was the only person who was kind of blunt enough to say that her initial idea was rubbish. In fact, I used a far more rude word, apparently, but, uh, you know, I'll be polite and won't um, 
uh, use it. Um, we but don't, um, we don't want the explicit parental <laughs> advisory exactly. sticker on this episode. But you know, it was it's kind of in a sense that's very much the type of relationship we've had all along. You know, so we've always kind of torn each other to pieces or torn apart our ideas and she really liked the fact that at last somebody was kind of engaged enough to to say oh it's not just marvelous but it's actually you know how about we do that so essentially we we hit it off so so this guy that introduced you so he was also working at msf no 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 he was a lawyer oh that makes more sense okay fine so i was was wondering realistically it's an interesting question around employee retention (laughs) at an organization like that because once you've gone and done something so meaningful and purposeful it must be really hard to tear yourself away so I was wondering who within the organization would encourage two people to leave it so oh to yeah, speak. No, no. yeah that yeah. it didn't quite happen like that but no I was really really compelled by it and I and I found myself because it took me a few months to extricate myself from from MSF and it was you know I, I felt this this really needed doing and it sounds strange now because I've 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 come to to love to learn about and love being a business but in those days I wasn't really that intent I mean it didn't matter that it was a business or not it, I just love the question that Zareen was kind of putting on the table which is you know how could we make people more generous in a way that makes the donor experience much much more rewarding because if you really think about it for a a very long time, I mean, I would argue until something like Just Giving came along, the real joy of giving, the real philanthropy was quite an elite sort of concern because, you know, if you're rich and you give, your name ends up in stone over a mantelpiece or whatever in a museum or in a, a science in- institution. And only the rich get fated for giving. But actually, it's still true today. It's much more ordinary people that make the world of giving roll. And for a long, long time, giving was kind of a solitary act and, and a little thankless. And that's something, certainly a philosophy we were applying at Médecins Sans Frontières. We, we loved to show the love to our donors because we owed them everything. You know, mm. they made, they funded all of the organization. And the idea that somebody who gives should have a wonderful experience and feel part of something that's done in their name is really what we were trying to do. So it wasn't about just, although we've done that as well, but, you know, make, make giving for charities more efficient or fundraising rather for charities, if you look at it from that perspective. So, of course, this was an industry, if you want to look at it that way, that could be improved with technology. You know, it, it, we also wanted to make it cheaper for charities to raise money. But ultimately, the ambition was always to to do a better job of connecting people who care about the the causes that they really care about and to have an expansive vision around that. You know, and I hadn't really met someone who had that sort of idea before and I thought that blew me away. That was worth leaving an amazing charity to join. I've only just started working with a charity, like properly, I mean. And so two statements that have been said to me from very experienced people, you know, the CEOs and chairman of a charity that's been running so they understand what they're doing, that I thought I'd share with you because you're probably, one is absolutely validating what you already know, but one of them is that the person who gives the check is every bit as important as the person who spends it, which of course is bang on the money for your philosophy. Mm. And the other is I got schooled for a few hours on why uh, for-profit philanthropy is so much more efficient than not-for-profit philanthropy. It was incredibly eye-opening because as a a lefty liberal who's uneducated on such matters until you go and join a charity and try and understand Mm. what is involved in it all, you can't really understand how that would possibly be the case. So I thought as we have an expert in the room, it'd be super interesting to get your perspectives on both those statements. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that that I fully understand the definition of of for-profit philanthropy, but if... if A for-profit charity. yeah, Yeah, yeah. I mean... I think particularly in Britain, oddly, there is a sort of a very hard distinction in most people's minds between business and charity. So on the one hand, you know, people really understand business exists purely to enrich shareholders. And and it's almost like a comforting thought. You know, we accept that business in the main can be quite rapacious and entirely self-serving. And on the other hand, you have this sort of almost romantic idea of charity, people being paid very little, doing things for free, being almost most virtuously poor. But if you really think about what needs doing in the world, whether it's finding a cure for cancer or any cause you can think about, that requires a lot of resource. So 
I feel very strongly that, and, and that's what we've set out to prove with Just Giving, is that you know, if we prove one thing, it's that really, is that it should be possible for more businesses to have an overt social mission. So our social mission has been and still is to grow the world of giving, to really tap into more generosity, not just to make it more efficient, to move money around. And it's always bothered me profoundly when people were shocked and a little angry at the suggestion, that, well, upon realising that we were a business. Because I think that there should be more capital flowing into businesses that address big societal challenges. And there are more and more. Just giving is by no means unique. But when we set up the business, it was pretty early in that line of thought. If I'm proud of one thing, it's that, that we've proven that it is possible to run a, a sustainable business, successful business, sustainably, um, and and have a big, big impact. So flat structures, employee involvement, and a business existing to serve others. So it does sound like the perfect cocktail of an incredible work environment. What were the underlying principles on which the business actually rested? So was it specifically, you know, any which way we can help the whole sector grow? Were there other aspects as well that sort of came out through the woodwork? And how different was where you got to at the end from where you intended to start? Yeah, I mean, one person who had a a, a huge influence and who was a real catalyst for thinking around this is um, our majority shareholder, Bela Hadvani, very unusual entrepreneur in his own right and sort of real visionary, really. And he was an incredibly powerful, positive influence on our thinking because instinctively, we weren't very eloquent about this in the early days of the business, but Serena and I really wanted to build a business that didn't have to too much management that was that tapped into the best intentions of the people it, you know it, it employed and got away with as much of those kind of cumbersome structures that a lot of us sadly are have become accustomed to you know we don't, we have a bit of a problem with authority and we didn't see why we should inflict that sort of thing on others but more fundamentally we we felt that it would be exciting to create a business and it would probably also give us a competitive advantage in, a, in acquiring talent. And I think that's proven true. If you create a business where you really say to people, look, here's the mission, here's the context, do your best and use your best judgment and be decent. And you don't need that many rules. So fundamentally, we, we felt... And it took a while for us to really explicitly say these things, but instinctively we were intent on creating a business which, you know, had a social mission, attracted people who wanted to fulfill that mission and used their common sense and were decent and behaved well. And when we look back, we realise that that sort of ethos, and I think it's it's very tangible when you walk into the business, there is a just giving us to, to us. And, and that turned out to be a very important competitive advantage because, and that's a consequence, not initial, an initial goal, but it gave us an edge when, you know, the, the competition came along or you know, people still trusted us because they knew they had worked with us over a number of years and knew that, yes, we were intent on building and sustaining profitable business. But at the same time, there was plenty of evidence that this business very often put its users first and it's the charities first. And, and there are plenty of examples of that. And that's how you build trust over, over time. So how many employees did you have at the point of you leaving? About 160, something and like that. I'm now curious what the uh, interview process was like. Did you have sort of a McKinsey style, you know, you have to be in that 1% of intelligence to hear some bizarre aptitude test questions. And then beyond that, it was all just values based? Because the structure you're suggesting mm -hmm. gives a lot of freedom to people, which is incredible. But to do that, then you must have had to have a very, very, very rigorous interview process to make sure you're getting it right. Or did you have a higher, fast, fire, faster kind of mentality? No, we took, I mean, inevitably at times you you have to let go of people, but we worked very hard over the years to, I wouldn't say perfect, but certainly evolve our, our hiring approach. We, we, we do favour <laughs> people with smarts. There's no question about that. But we also often hired slightly counterintuitively or people who were ostensibly of a particular discipline who we could attract to another. We tended to favour 
One of our head of people, Andy Meikle, called them Mohicans, you know, people who wouldn't necessarily fit elsewhere, often thrived in, in, in just giving because we were giving, uh, I say were because I'm no longer there every day and, I, you know, I can't vouch for the present. But for many years, we paid perhaps more attention than businesses of our, other businesses of our size to the whole culture and and creating a place where people would feel fulfilled, challenged and respected. So... I guess one of the uh, obvious points of running a for-profit company that's growing really fast as well is you can afford to be competitive. So you can afford to have the best people on the best salaries, etc., because it's a competitive environment getting those people. But if you have a meaningful mission, that's quite often one of the main reasons that gets explained to me as to why running for-profit charitable businesses is so important. So you can attract the best talent and make sure they're doing good for you. And therefore, for yes, the world. I think I think having a sustainable business model trumps relying on handouts. I mean, in particularly for an infrastructure heavy business. I mean, arguably, and we've discussed this over our, with our users and our charities over many years because we regularly were asked, you know, why did you choose to be a business and not a, a non for profit? Is that when you look at the level of investment, sustained investment, millions of pounds went into this business for many years. And we need, as you've just said, we needed to attract the best of technology talent, not just, you know, your average techie. We needed to really punch above our weight because we were doing very ambitious things. You know, technologists, product people, marketeers, data scientists in, in the later years. So in order to compete, we needed to have the ability to attract that talent and to achieve that, we needed to be a sustainable business. So, so I, I feel very strongly about that concept that it should be possible for more businesses to be successful on a commercial basis and have a big social impact at once. And on the subject of becoming sustainable, what about raising money? How did you go about? You mentioned one of your investors previously. So, what was your fundraising story? And obviously, you have two fundraising stories: one with your users fundraising for charities, but your own one to sustain the business and get, I guess, VC return. What's the story there? We have a very unusual fundraising story. We raised some angel money in the very, very early days, obviously. And then we had a major a second round, a proper second round in 2001, two thereabouts. And that was actually our final round. You know, looking back, if you re- rewrote history, you, you could argue perhaps this business should have raised more money and grown faster, perhaps done different things more rapidly. I mean, hindsight is always perfect. But on balance, I think we were given a, a major injection of cash at that time, which enabled us to hire and uh, and grow was that but from venture capital or no it wasn't it was an angel and in, oh, an yes, angel. yes okay. um but but the i should talk perhaps a little bit more about the 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 philosophy of that particular individual the fact that he took an incredibly long term view of the business really encouraged us to to try new things very leading edge at the time i mean his he encouraged the our vision to really think about the wealth of data we were creating and and, and new ways of really interrogating that data, which with hindsight it was incredibly visionary. So in a sense, he was talking about data science years before that that term became common parlance. I mean, there are challenges in in every corporate story, but I credit that influence and that very benevolent, patient, long term view of the business for having enabled Just Giving to thrive. I think a really interesting similarity that you have in this point of view is one of our guests was Ali Parsa from Babylon Health. Mm. And he's not a fan of VC funding in any kind of respect, but you can listen to his episode for his details of it. But the really interesting thing in terms of how he went to fund Babylon, his whole point was, I want to build a really big, meaningful business. And I know what that looks like. And There is no VC that can support and finance and genuinely believe in and align itself with a meaningful business because I need a 10-year plan. Mm. And it's what you've just said, which is that 10-year plan. And his whole thing is I went straight to investors saying everything's going to change in every two years. So you can't basically be a VC because you'll be worrying about the next stage, the next stage. I need money for 10 years. This is what we can execute if we're focused on it. And it sounds really similar. That's right. I, I think that the, the long term, it, it's also, you know, taking a long term view is also very, very bold and risky. Our, our, our majority shareholder, Bela Hadvani, was incredibly supportive of our vision and took a very long term view. But that's 
partly, I think, because he grew up professionally in the United States. And the UK VC and certainly PE scene here is, is, is very different. And I think everyone who's had exposure to both can see the differences. Yeah. AKA, the bigger and crazier the idea, the more likely you are to get it funded in America. And also, therefore becomes an upward cycle of the more likely it is to actually have a chance of succeeding. Where did you actually meet this investor then? We were in an incubator in Soho in the very early days. And one of our colleagues who were incubating us um, came across him and said that he probably knew somebody who was crazy enough to support this particular business. And it turned out to be right. That is the best kind of way. So, I mean, what was, do you remember what your first pitch was to him or anything like that? Have you ever reminisced about how Super mad you unusual. must have It was, Zareen did most of the heavy lifting, which involved walking for hours around Holland Park and Kensington Gardens talking about life. <laughs> it turned out that Baylor's form of due diligence was to judge people's character um, over over their business plans. Yeah, that's a great way of doing it, though. And you only, so you only ever had one person on your cap table? Oh, no, no, no. We, no, okay. we, have, a, we have a range of investors, yes. Sure. But, but he's, he's, he was definitely the, the largest, yeah. Okay. And he must have been very happy with the outcome after all of that, to be fair, if so in so early as well. Whilst we're on the subject of making people happy, tell us some of the amazing stories that you will have got from your users along the way. Can you remember any like particular stories or, you know, from people that had been donated just out of surprise or, you know, people that ultimately had been given the opportunity to raise money for causes and actually contacted you guys directly. Yes. And there are so many stories. I'm struggling to pick one. Well, I would imagine so, um, yeah. <laughs> what's really lovely is when someone starts small and intends to raise a thousand pounds and ends up raising an absolute fortune. That That's remarkable. I mean, and there have been in the last few years, whether it was a dog's home in the north of England burning down, raising hundreds of thousands to more tragically Manchester, London bombings, etc. What's been really moving is is to notice almost in real time that every time something uh, really upsetting happened, people reached for just giving and sort of wanted to put the world to rights a little bit. And everyone knows that money doesn't solve everything, but it's been incredibly gratifying to see people come together and express often their solidarity and the, just their love, really, by raising tons of money. And and every year we, we run an awards ceremony and every year the very best of the best of Just Giving comes together in a room and we celebrate. And it's incredibly humbling. I mean, because, you know, as I said at the start of this, it used to be the preserve of the very of an elite group to be recognized and really celebrated for what they did for their community. And I'm really, it's very touching, actually, to see loads of people. And I mean, and as I said, in, in that room, it's just the best of the best, but there are ta thousands every day, you know, who sort of do this, the same. And there's a, such a deep sense of satisfaction that you knew there was something wrong in your community or somebody needed your help. And you were able to not only help yourself, but bring your network with you and people are often often say the most touching things to you and in writing and you know you get countless of emails all the time where people say that really is the highlight of my year decade life whatever and so it's really incredibly meaningful for people hey guys this is luke here co-founder of contour space Sorry to interrupt this awesome podcast, but I just wanted to tell you a bit more about us. We're a startup ourselves, helping awesome companies find amazing office spaces from start to finish, whether you're looking for a couple of desks to your next big HQ. We take care of the whole process from start to finish, and our service is completely free. Check us out on contour.space. Okay, so you've started a career in journalism, moved over to uh, like an incredible organization like uh, Medicine Sans Frontier, and then created one of the most meaningful organizations of modern times. So the question is, what on earth do you do next? How do you encore that? Are you as a human being, and this is going to get much more deep into you as a person now, that's an unbelievable trajectory of really interesting and exponentially more meaningful and purposeful activities. So where do you go from there? Or do you not torture yourself with that kind of stuff? Impossible not to torture yourself, right? <laughs> I mean, 
At the moment, I'm practicing the pause, right? So, which is to sort of take stock and catch up, really, with all the, the the stuff that's been going on, as I feel has been going on, as I was busy looking elsewhere, which was just giving. I mean, I'm sure everyone who's at this table talking to you on this podcast talks about a complete obsession. I mean, it's impossible to run something you love and not become totally monomaniacal about it, right? And then, as I am now, in between things, or certainly post-Just Giving, as I sort of step down imminently, I feel that I actually need to look up and sort of take stock and look at what's been happening in the wider world. And there's just so much. And as a parent, for example, one of the things that I'm really struck by right now, as I look for, you know, wh where are the spaces I'd like to possibly get involved? And one of them is education. I'm, I'm getting involved with the one ed tech business. And because I'm struck by a little bit as I did when I was looking at the world of giving 18 years ago, I think, gosh, it hasn't changed. You know, this whole world of how children, and not, not to mention adults, but that's even a, a bigger issue, but children are taught and are corralled and marshaled in, through education in a way that hasn't fundamentally changed for decades, generations. Yes, okay, the, 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 the white boards are now white and not black, but I mean, fundamentally, it's incredibly straight jacketed. And so I think, and um, this is really not a, a, an original thought, but the, that's potentially something I would love to get involved in. You know, how can we completely personalize the experience? How can we make learning something that is so much more rewarding? So that certainly will be, will be an area Have you seen many of Ken Robinson's talks? They're, yeah. they're always about that. They're just so poignant because the stories he tells are so simple and yet so obvious. And there's that famous one about that dancer who was just crap at school but became this world-class dancer and was just, you know, the best paid dancer and choreographer in the world. So had an incredible career but was disencouraged from doing any of it as a kid because it wasn't academic. That's right. And it's like examples of that everywhere. So if you could obviously personalise education, you know, how much more successful could the human race be? That's right. Flip I mean, side and, to that is how it might not even be a good thing to make everyone too expert in the human race because obviously the flip side is seem to be exponentially improving every aspect of human intelligence at the moment. Do you, do you look at things like AI? Of course. And and the big question, I'm not a technologist, so I, I think about, you know, the things around it. How can we better equip our, our kids and ourselves, of course? But at the moment, as I have more time to spend with my family, I think a great deal about how can I help my son who's in his early teens? How do I encourage him to be relevant and to be engaged and to learn in the right way. Those are the things that I'm wrestling with right now because the synthesis or what is the expression again about the moment when intelligence become all artificial intelligence is is entirely autonomous. We have a way to go. I mean, the, we can all bet that it will take a while. So what's the human relevance between now and then? And there's tons to play for. I mean, using Moore's law, there's not that long, so we might need you to think faster. All right, okay. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> we interrupt this episode to invite you to enjoy a moment of calm. I'm Tamara Levitt, the writer and narrator of the meditations in the Calm app. Amidst the chaos and busyness of life, It's so important to pause. The calm and clarity we gain through meditation is an essential part of what makes a great leader. So take a moment now to close your eyes and bring your attention to your breath. Inhaling deeply and exhaling slowly. Feel your lungs expanding and contracting. And as you take this next breath, feel your whole body relax. And then, when you're ready, Open your eyes. To learn more about the Calm app, visit 
calm.com slash secret leaders for a one month trial. And now back to today's guest. So just in terms of, you know, how you're spending your days. So to be boring for now, what does a typical day look like for Anne-Marie, but potentially a bit more exciting? What did it look like back in the day? So let's go right to the heart of when things were just growing really fast. What did a typical day look like then? Well, it was kind of a, a little bit unstructured. I mean, when, when you run or co-run, in our case, an organization, sometimes you look back on your day and you say, what did I actually do? So, you know, you talk to people, you're in meetings most of the day, you, you talk to product, you talk to your commercial teams. I spend a lot of time with the people who were facing our partners, charities, events, corporates, etc. So I spent a lot of time working with the people who were advocating for us, essentially. That was part of our growth engine. And, you know, you sometimes went home thinking, all I've done is just ask a few questions. The more your organization grows, the less, you know, you are in the soil. You know? So your job is to, to, to sort of ask better questions, hopefully. And how did you feel doing that when comparing it to being someone who's more used to being on the ground? Well, I mean, Zareen used to tease me that this was my biggest challenge, you know, not getting involved. And at times, even until quite late, I couldn't help changing some copy or <laughs> I know it was it was really sort of uh, untoward really but yeah, at times I couldn't I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't uh, help myself at times so you're not a flawless leader oh I, I am full of flaws it's terrible I love I love doing so at times it was really excruciating but over the years I, I, I like to think that I became better at stepping back and and asking the questions rather than providing the answers I worked very hard at that actually Okay, so now, other than wondering how your son's life is going to look in the next five to 10 years, what else do you do on a daily basis? So you get up at what time? Oh, 6.30. Okay. Yeah, the, the yeah, teenager now you're gets out of work. up. Yeah, right. Obviously, you still need to get up at 6.30. Yes, God forbid I do, you fly I'm in. afraid. Yeah. No, 6.30 is the alarm clock. Well, I hate to say this, but it's not super structured my day. You know, friends and family I had totally neglected for years. And so I'm in major catch-up mode on that front, which is lovely. And how are they reacting to that? Uh, mixed reviews. I'm sure that my son is not particularly appreciating my presence at homework time. But otherwise, I think it's, well... I selfishly think is wonderful. As I said in a, a moment ago, I, I, it's just lovely to be able to have more time to think. I mean, I had completely abandoned fiction. I don't know. It's as if my brain was totally b- obsessed with the business or business related stuff and the ability to reconnect with something that was really quite important to me has been amazing. So I'm reading voraciously, very widely. I'm reconnecting with all sorts of things like political writing and, you know, and boy, the world's interesting. I mean, it's a bit like, I feel a bit like a child in a sweet shop. There's so much to sort of consider. So I'm still in the ideation phase. You know, I'm throwing a lot of stuff against the wall. And hopefully in the next few months, the themes will begin to emerge. So if you ask me again, I'm giving myself another six months or so. So you think you're giving yourself another six months or so to formulate another idea to go again? Uh, Don't know yet. Or, you know, don't know the shape it will take, but I can't possibly possibly be doing leisure. I mean, that will kill me. But you could, for example, be, and this is what I would expect someone like yourself to say, who has accomplished so much already. You have so much expertise and a wide variety of potential interests. You don't know that yet, as you're saying, but you might do. So wouldn't it be um, also an opportunity to do a lot of investing yourself and advising and working on boards in a whole bunch of different areas? Does that not interest you or is it not doing enough? Yes, I'm going to experiment with the non-exec space, definitely. That's imminent and it's lovely. I've done it informally and I've, I've been surprised by how enjoyable it was to, to work with a young entrepreneur to understand their business. It's really lovely. But who knows? I mean, I might in a while realise that, you know, the itch to do something is too great mm. and I just don't know yet. It's really hard to suspend one's judgment, but it's a real luxury to be able to say, you know, this is You've to see what... To decide. W- w- See what bubbles up, yeah. And would you do a business again with a co-founder? Would you try and do it all alone? Alone is, it's a terrible idea. You absolutely need a co-founder. I mean, in the case of Just Giving, the the relationship I've, I had with Zareen was, without contest, the best thing about the experience I had. It so was just the most precious thing. Would you ask Zareen to do it again? Or? 
I would love to, but I don't know whether our points in life are are really converging, but I can't think of anyone else. I mean, it it was a real privilege, actually. By the end of our uh, professional sort of gig, we're still the best of friends, but professionally, we, we almost shared a brain, really. And I would really struggle to work with somebody else. That's fair. I mean, you've had a lot of experience working together, right? Coming out the back of the experience of Just Giving then, what has been the best experience from having such success? Has there been anything great? Have you met the Queen? Is there anything like that? Does that kind of stuff even impress you or was it something else entirely? I'm quite a Republican, Dan, I'm okay. afraid to say. No, I think... Throw that... it out there. <laughs> Was it meeting Megan and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, pass on that. No, it's I'm I'm not impressed by that sort of stuff. The the real pleasure, in a way, has been to realise just how this application, which you know, you look at it, and when you've created something, it's forever fragile and small. You can't quite connect with the idea that it has become something that is known and adopted and actually quite liked by a lot of people. But it's it's those moments when you realise it's become almost a noun. You know, uh, a few years ago there was a Jeremy Hardy sketch on radio and I was washing the dishes and and he cracked a just giving joke and everybody in the audience got it and that really stopped me in my tracks I just thought oh my god they really get it you know and that was lovely and as I said before it's just meeting users who consider this experience raising money helping others achieve something really tangible and really cherishing that as an important expression of themselves that's really quite touching and throughout the whole life of the business, I've always been almost awed by the amount of trust that people place in this platform. It's just its just so fascinating to think about the culture inside your company because you would have had so many sombering moments every minute if you were to obviously have the time to look at all the messages. Because, I mean, I can't actually think of even an edge case where you raise money for a cause that isn't based around some kind of sadness in some respect. Yeah, yeah. Is, are there any? Very few. (laughs) There's a fair amount of comedy. You know, I mean, people do amazing things, but fundamentally charities exist because there are things that are wrong Mm. or unjust or that need getting right. And um, yes, the background can be quite dark. But, you know, this is one of the the real joys of tech companies. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the tech world. I, I think tech companies... And, you know, the the area from which we're recording this is known for this sort of, you know, the cult of growth at at all costs and particularly quite a macho attitude. But there's something that is irreplaceable at the heart of of, of technology, which is scale. And, you know, for me, having worked for one single charity and having enjoyed it immensely was one thing, but being able to enable almost an unlimited number of causes to be more successful. That's incredibly rewarding. And that's part of the people. And (laughs) and 160 people employed in this business could come to work every day and think, you know, we have had a huge impact through our users, of course. So scale is is addictive. And And especially addictive if it's making an impact on people's lives. You must have had some very smart people very. working for a very ambitious boss and if you couldn't quite meet those targets I know I've been told that I wasn't always quick to praise and I know that at times I'm I got the balance wrong because I'm not terrifically good at receiving praise myself I don't give it readily and so it can come across as if I ignore the amazing things that have just happened in order to come to the next challenging question so I know I have that tendency over the years I've thought ah hang on pause appreciate first even if you would find it awkward to receive that praise so pause and give it when when I was beginning to say my goodbyes to to the business people said very very interesting things about you know then they were free to say them (laughs) and it's interesting how people perceive you and it is a little bit you know on the one hand people said it was really annoying to be questioned all the time but it was also what made the culture so you know I was a I'm sure a deeply imperfect boss as is everyone yeah 
Okay, well, a deeply imperfect boss, but a perfect mother, as I'm sure your son would say. How would he describe you? Well, he would definitely call me bossy. Okay, what about your daughter (laughs) instead then? (laughs) Probably the the same. same. I mean, she's much older. But yeah, I mean, I, I try to... I suppose you can't change your stripes, right? So we like to inquire and I like to ask tough questions at work and I like to be also at the receiving end of those questions and I like that my kids can be as challenging to me as I can be to them. Okay, I I know you said it's a difficult one to answer, but in the context of, I guess, the here and now, who inspires you? So obviously, really broad, impossible to say, but in the context of what you might be interested to do next, you said you're reading a lot, so... Where's your inspiration coming from? If it's a couple of people, then that's fine too. Yeah, there's lots. It's funny, I realised as I was looking at various businesses and models and what's what's out there that's interesting, I was struck by how little I was drawn to the tech world. And maybe I'm, you know, you could point me in the direction of cool stuff happening in that space. But in general, I have found that the tech world has been relatively slow at developing a sort of peripheral vision about the impact it has on the world. And I think it's obvious from the the, the latest developments from Facebook to Google to now the Amazon sort of local tax scandal in Seattle, right? Not scandal, but sort of kerfuffle. I think for an industry that's supposedly addicted to change and really at ease with it and constant disruption, it looks very incensed when it, it is challenged by society. And in contrast, I find that it's rather bricks and mortar companies that have done some deep thinking or deeper thinking about its impact on the world and how it should relate to that and how it should behave. And, you know, it's an obvious example, but you look at Patagonia, the sort of outdoor gear company, and it's doing incredible things. It's being generous in the true sense of the word. I find that inspiring. So to your point on growth, because I've read and listened to a lot from him and you know the the true nature of why that is even possible and the case is because and this is also his argument if you want to build a sustainable company you don't go for growth so he didn't right as he wasn't building a company to build a company he was building patagonia because he loved it and it just happened to have to grow and people got brought into their social impact so then the growth becomes a necessity, so to speak. Um, oh, it's an outcome. It's an outcome, yes. precisely. Yeah. So that's a really nice way of framing it. But again, that's what happens when you get, I think, very mission-led people starting businesses. It's, it's an interesting one, though, because you mentioned Facebook as an example. And I was having this debate with someone recently, but actually there is no legislation to suggest that what Facebook did was wrong. So in many ways, they are holding themselves to account and being a self-regulating company, which is progressive. And I'm not supporting them, you know, in this sense. In fact, I'm on the other side on a personal level. But taking an even point of view, it's quite fascinating to know that they've they've done nothing legally wrong, yet they're willing to sit there in front of a Senate and discuss ways to improve these things. That is progress in some respects, because there's a lot of companies that if they were outside within the realms of law, wouldn't be willing to hold themselves to account that way. So I think that's quite encouraging. In some respects. Yes, you could you could say that, but I mean the the law is is a lagging thing. <laughs> it it follows the zeitgeist and the, the the views of the people. It doesn't tend to lead it. So I think it's a little bit like MPs. If you put a moral filter on this question, when the expenses scandal broke in the UK a few years back, a lot of MPs hadn't broken the law. But they had broken the social contract that you and I would recognise as being in force between people and the people who represent them in Parliament. And I think a lot of companies say, but we're not doing anything illegal. Fine. But that is completely missing the point. So I I think it's an exciting time because there's absolutely no debate now that companies can't just exist to serve shareholder interests. They have to. It's a matter of survival. They have to consider a much broader set of factors and to really ask themselves, you know, with all this power, outsized, unprecedented power, you know, what is our responsibility? And I think that's going to be, you know, creating a lot of opportunity in years to come. What is your opinion? I feel like I know the answer, but your opinion on work-life balance? I think it's a bit of a myth. You, you, you can never achieve it. Let's put it this way. You can't achieve it in one day or one week. I felt guilty as, as the next parent, as any parent would have been when I was working super intensely for the business. But I sort of 
knew that my family knew that one day that would abate and I would be more available. And that's the case now and it might change. And so, you know, I think the best thing to do with work-life balance is to sort of look at chunks of life and say, as long as they even out during that period, you're going to be okay. But otherwise, it's a tyranny, right? I mean, you, you are supposed to be healthy and and to sleep enough and all of that stuff. Well, that's just not going to happen. happen. Yeah. Are you glass half full or half empty? Half full. But not 100% no. sure. No. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> On, On balance, offense. I think it's half full, yeah. Okay. So, it, it, you know, this is an important question. So... Obviously, you've you've seen on your platform a lot of stories, as we discussed, stuff that comes in emotionally, ups and downs and stuff. What was your most challenging moment at Just Giving? Was there ever a moment where you thought the whole thing was going to flop and everything looked like it was going south and there was a saving grace? Were there any particular dark days? This is like the important stuff to share. There were many. There was one where I was away, but I'll mention it because, you know, sometimes lessons come from these things. I was away, so therefore it's Zareen and the rest of the team that carried the can. But we made a what we thought was a wise um, technical shift. So we, we did a big platform switch over and it went catastrophically wrong and our site was down for well over a week. And it was incredibly challenging. And when I returned, I mean, I've obviously offered to return, but Zareen said, look, stay on holiday, get some sleep because you're going to have a lot of apologizing to do when you return. (laughs) And in the weeks and months after that terrible car crash basically happened, I learned a lot about what you needed to do to put things right and not avoiding contact with the people who scream and shout at you because they're quite cross with you. And I sort of learned that that's when you basically you show up, you know, you don't hide behind your PR people, etc. You go and be slapped around the face with a wet fish by people who have higher expectations of you. So we learned a tons of stuff, you know, around tech etc not ever to consider a big bang switch over you know i can't believe with hindsight we ever considered it but you know beyond the tech stuff it was a matter of learning how to say you know you've messed up really own it and and learn from it and in a sense that was a very formative moment another moment which was pretty scary was when serious competition entered uh, our space not just competition but competition in the form of what I felt was quite uh, unfair competition, if you like. So in the form of a bank and and shortly followed by a big telecoms company. And I was really quite cross. I thought, you know what? Here's an independent business, completely self-funded, that's trying to prove something quite important, that it's you know, that it should be possible to provide a, a really good value service to charities and charge unashamedly for it. And how dare you come into this space and do it for free or at, you know, vastly reduced costs, subsidized on a subsidized basis to burnish your brand, you know. So I was quite cross about that at that time. And in a sense that... any conflicts directly with the people running those? Well, I mean, it's been been pretty sort of, you know, robust competition. But with hindsight, it was probably the making of Just Giving. First, it validated, it turned out that, you know, that having real competition in a market creates a market. We were a market of one before. But more importantly... I think it really sort of asked the real existential question of us, you know, we could either choose to compete on price, actually, that would have killed the business, or we could proudly remain the the premium service. Pound per pound, we charge more, but we help people raise more money. And so that was the rallying cry for us internally. We needed to demonstrate that if you choose Just Giving, you're going to raise more money. And we have continued to prove that. We reinvented our platform. We launched an unprecedented number of innovations that year and the year after and, and beyond. And that really galvanized us into really sort of living fully into our mission. And I'm really, really proud that I mean in in the London Marathon which we no longer are officially associated with in the last few uh, in the last London Marathon in April we we raised more money than ever you know close to 25 million and we're still to this day the number one platform for that event and I say that with you know it's great cheeky pride yeah cheeky pride (laughs) because you know these things matter and I think competitive pride yeah and I think that it, it really was a matter of great pride to be able to say look 
we believe charity for charity cheap is not always best why is it that the most important things in life you know cancer research looking after kids looking after you know the elderly finding cures for rare diseases why should that be done on a shoestring they deserve good causes deserve the best infrastructure access to innovation constant r&d why should that be done on a charitable basis it should be done on a commercial basis and if i'm proud of one thing is that one that we've proven that you know there is there is a future for robustly you know and you know sustainable commercial businesses to serve the non-for-profit world and so before we wrap up, because that would have been a perfect way to end, but of course, being the awkward person I am, I have just two more questions. Best piece of advice you've ever been given by someone along your journey? By my dad to always, always not be afraid to hang out with people who are clearly smarter than me. I thought that was a very good piece of advice because the temptation... You as a young person? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he said, you're going you're gonna to hang out with... If you're going to go anywhere, you're going to hang out with people who are... You're going to be scarily brighter or more, you know, more polished mm. and, and smarter than you. Just choose them. Okay. And then your, because you can't copy your dad's advice. So for listeners, your advice to anyone listening now and feeling inspired by your words. No pressure, of course. Do you know, the thing that I, I wish I'd known, it was okay for a tech business to persist because there is really stain the problem because there is a real addiction to the idea of the pivot. You know, if you don't show quick revenue, quick traction, quick this or this or that, your investors are immediately on your back to say, all right, in that case, just pivot. In fact, some of the greatest strategic bets we made in this business, I don't know whether it's true of others, but this business were those that took quite some time to prove traction. And if we had pivoted too soon, we would have completely missed the boat. And so patience. Patience is powerful. Patience is powerful. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, Anne Marie. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Next week on Secret Leaders. When you love something, it's not work anymore. So if you're working 12 hours or 18 hours, you're working yourself you know, to the bone. That is where stress and everything else kicks in. But when you love what you do, then you never work a single day in your life. Live in the now. The now is all that you have. Tomorrow is a dream. Yesterday is already gone. The only control you have over your life, over everything that you do, is in now. That was Vijay Eswaran, the Malaysian billionaire and philanthropist who, after getting kicked out of university in Singapore, is sent to London by his parents to study and consequently started his career, if you can believe it, driving a London black taxi. If you want to know how that story unfolds, then tune in or you'll miss out. Don't miss an episode by subscribing to us on iTunes or Spotify. Just search for Secret Leaders. You can also check out our website at secretleaders.com for show notes and behind the scenes of each interview. Hi, I'm Simon LaFoss, the founder of LaFoss Associates. We're a young, high-growth and co-owned business and we're experts in attracting talent. If you want to build a great team or you just want advice, please get in touch. We run free seminars and we'd love to see you there. Thanks for your time. This episode was hosted by Dan Murray, produced by me, Rich Martell, edited by Harry Morton at Lower Street Media. And if you're hearing this, that's probably thanks to Jennifer Osman, our marketing whiz from Canada.